Today we're taking a deep dive into this tiny bunkhouse cabin that I built on my property here in Alaska. It's a 10 by 12 cabin with a four foot porch and it's totally off grid. If you haven't already seen it, there is a full start to finish video on this build, which I linked down in the description. But in this video, I'm going into great depth and detail about every single step and specification about the cabin. I also saved all of my receipts while building. So by the end of the video, I'll be able to tell you exactly how much it costs to build something like this. Keep in mind that I'm a total amateur do-it-yourself builder, and so this video is just what I've figured out and what worked for me. I hope the information gives you something of use. All right, so we're gonna go from the bottom and work our way up. So the first thing is the foundation. For this, I used pier blocks instead of sauna tubes. Normally, um, you would wanna dig down deep into the ground and pour concrete with rebar and have your uh, foundation below the frost line. The reason that I used pier blocks instead of doing sauna tubes is because it's a really small structure and it's not gonna have a whole lot of ability to flex any which way. So if it does start to heave or settle, I can always use the adjustable brackets on top of the pier blocks to level things out. The more important thing with frost line isn't so much if the area freezes, does the soil that your cabin's on have water in it? And I have really good dry building land right here. All around me is swamp and muskeg, but right here on my property, I'm up on a little knoll and I mostly have sand and gravel. So I haven't had any problems with heaving on any of my structures. So you can totally build on top of the ground in a frost area as long as it's well drained and you've got good strong soil. And while heaving may not be a problem, you do want to make sure and dig down below the topsoil. If you put your pier blocks directly on top of the squishy forest floor, that will sink very quickly. So what I did was dig down about eight to 10 inches and backfill with good sand and gravel and tamped it down as I went. A good trick for busting through the roots underneath the soil is using a sawzall to cut them away. So the pier blocks are spaced about four to five feet apart and uh, the beam that sits on top of them is a four by 10 pressure treated beam. So those spans given the roof load that I probably will have is pretty adequate um, for the beam sizing. Remember your beam size needs to be proportional to how much load those walls are gonna carry. So if you're in somewhere like me with a really heavy snow load, you either need a really big beam or you need supports pretty frequently. And like I was saying, these pier blocks have adjustable brackets on them. So after I kind of get the general level of everything, I can put the beams down and then just twist those up and down to get everything nice and level. And so if things do start to settle over the next couple of years, I can go back in and level things out. A good trick that I figured out if you are gonna use sauna tubes is to put PVC inside the wet concrete in the center of the sauna tube tube right before it finishes setting. So that way you have a hole inside of your pier that you could put an adjustable bracket base in. And that way you'd have the same uh, ability to go up and down with it even after the concrete set. So I use 16 foot beams for the foundation of the cabin even though it's only a 12 foot cabin. The reason for that is that I wanted to have a porch that hangs off the front. You really want to try to have your porch tied in structurally to the cabin. And so by having these beams here, I know that the porch isn't going to try to sag or do anything weird like that. I made that mistake when I built my sauna. I actually did the beams um, crossways instead of long ways. And then the porch was just hanging off of uh, joist hangers. And as everything settled and the weight started to get onto it, I started to get kind of a taco effect between the front floor joist and the sauna itself. And I had to go in and jack it up and fix that. So don't make that mistake and make sure to have your beams supporting your porch or something that you're able to level out really well. The other reason for that is that this is going to be a load bearing porch. The poles from the roof come straight down and onto the porch. So I wanted to make sure that it had good support underneath it to handle the big uh, snow loads that the roof has. You really want to think long and hard about where your cabin's going to go before you start putting in your foundation. Once you have your cabin side all picked out, you can use stakes and a string. Go around and make a perfect square of the size of the cabin that you want and make sure to measure the corners. So corner to corner, corner to corner. And if those are equal distances, then you've got a square. So after you've got your foundation done with your beam set, it's time to move on to your floor joists. I opted to use two by six floor joists uh, and I used pressure treated. You don't have to use pressure treated floor joists as long as they're up off the ground a good ways, but there's a lot of moisture that comes up off the ground and you're not gonna wanna have to go in and redo those at any point. So I think using pressure treated floor joists is a smart move. So the cabin is 12 feet long this way and 12 feet wide against the back. Whoops, I meant to say 10 feet wide against the back, which means that these two by six floor joists have to span from beam to beam. And even though it's a 10 foot wide cabin, I use some cantilever about five and a half inches on either side of the beam. So that means that the joists overhang the beams. And then also the width of the beams themselves add up so that it's only the distance between the two beams that you're actually spanning. Um, I use two by sixes for that. 
I probably could have done two by eights and had a little bit more of a firm floor. Two by six is a pretty small board to span those eight feet, but so far I haven't had any problems with it, especially once I got the flooring on, everything feels really firm. And um, I did 16 inch on center for these. You don't want to do 24 inch on center for your floor joists unless you're using really heavy joists and really heavy decking on top of it. It'll just have too much flex in the floor. A really important thing to keep in mind is that when you're using pressure treated lumber to make sure and use something like deck screws or galvanized nails. If you don't use something with a coating on it, it's gonna eat away the metal of the nail over time. The chemicals that are in the treated wood are really potent and will actually dissolve the metal. And then the whole thing will just fall apart one day. So make sure to use some kind of actual coated deck screw or galvanized nail for anything that's going into your pressure treated wood. So I like to lay out the main square of the subfloor first and then I uh, measure 16 on center. And I do it from the same starting point on each side. That's really important. If you pull 16 inch on center from the left side and then pull it from the right side on the next one, they're not gonna line up. Make sure and do that. I've made that mistake before. Again, as you go, make sure that everything is square and you can use the square to either check the pockets of your joists or you can measure from corner to corner on your uh, subfloor and make sure that it is in fact still square. So once you've got your floor joists in, I recommend securing them to the beams with something like a hurricane tie. That will just make sure that the cabin won't be able to lift up and off the beams if a really strong wind or seismic event comes along. After you've got that all done, it's time to insulate the floor. Now you can go a lot of different ways for insulating the floor on a cabin. I've seen a lot of people put an under piece of plywood and then put like fiberglass in there and then a piece of plywood on top of that. I don't really like using fiberglass for underneath cabins for a couple of reasons. And uh, the first being that critters will get up there and eat the fiberglass out and take it and make nests with it. And it's kind of a big invitation for getting little things up there. The other thing is that moisture coming up from the ground will make that fiberglass wet over time and it'll start to just clump up and fall out of the underside of the cabin. If you use some kind of chicken wire or something to hold it in, I could see it working pretty well, but I would definitely be cautious about that. But a good solution to that is just using foam for insulation. I just used uh, two inch foam insulation on this cabin and so far it's held up really well. On top of the uh, foam insulation, I put a layer of what's called Reflectix bubble wrap. And that's a trick that I learned on YouTube that will help keep the thermal bridging down. And so uh, cold air is gonna wanna transfer through your studs and into your floor since there's no insulation covering it. But if you cover the whole thing with that uh, Reflectix wrap, it'll help keep that um, effect way down. The other thing about that bubble wrap is that it provides a bit of an air and moisture barrier. So any of the cold air or moisture coming up from the ground will have a harder time getting into your cabin. All right, so once you have your insulation in and ready to go, it's time to do the decking on the subfloor. Uh, for the decking on this cabin, I used a three quarter inch OSB and it's tongue and groove. Tongue and groove is a really smart choice for your subfloor um, because it stops the buckling effect that um, normal plywoods will have. As they expand, they can go up and sort of buckle, leaving these ridges in your floor. But if you use tongue and groove, that effect is a lot less. You don't wanna skimp out on your subfloor decking. It's really important that it has some good thickness to it, otherwise you'll get flex and bow in your floor when you walk on it. The last thing you wanna make sure and do with your subfloor is glue it and screw it. So if you put um, some kind of adhesive on the bottom of your decking and then screw it into the subfloor, it'll stop it from squeaking over the years. The only catch with this one is that since I did the Reflectix wrap, I couldn't really glue it to that. So I just used deck screws and skipped the glue. And so far I haven't had any squeaking, knock on wood but uh, we'll see what happens with it over the years. But as long as you use screws, just don't use nails with no glue. And for this cabin, I used two by four walls. And a lot of times you'd want to use a two by six wall if you're in a really cold climate. And the reason for that is that you can get more insulation in a two by six wall than you can in a two by four wall. The reason I didn't do that for this cabin is it's a guest cabin that only gets used a handful of times every year and it doesn't really have any problem getting warm and staying warm. It might be a little less efficient on fuel in the long run, but overall it does a perfectly fine job of staying warm. It works best to build all your walls directly on your subfloor. That way you have a nice flat square surface to work on. Just make sure you don't accidentally nail your wall into the subfloor, which yeah, I've done that too. For the walls, I also did 16 inch on center, which is really common for walls. You wanna consider what height you're gonna make your walls for your cabin. The higher you go, the more space you get for something like a loft. On my main cabin, I did 10 foot walls and then a steep pitch on the roof. And that gave me a ton of room up in the loft for things like a bed and, and standing room. But little cabin like this, I didn't need to do a loft. The only thing I wanted to have was a cathedral ceiling and bunk beds so that the person on the top of the bunk wasn't like up close to the top of the wall when they were sleeping. I went with eight foot walls in this cabin, but remember when you're cutting your wall studs that you have to account for the bottom plate width as well as double top plates. So you're gonna have a two by four that goes across the bottom, which will be an inch and a half, one that goes across the top, that's an inch and a half, and then another one that'll go on top of that, that'll tie it into the front wall. 
and um, that will equal four and a half inches. So you wanna cut your stud down to account for that four and a half inches extra that you're gonna get from your top and bottom plates. Once you've got your first wall finished, it's time to stand that thing up, which can be a little tricky if you're by yourself. Uh, the bigger the wall, obviously the harder it's gonna to be to lift, but also consider that the more framing you have in the wall, like if you have window framing with headers and extra cripple studs, things like that, it'll start to get exponentially heavier. So one wall that might not have any extra framing could be easily lifted by one person, but one that has two or three windows in it might get really heavy and unable to be lifted by one person. These 10 by 12 walls at eight foot height were about the maximum of what I could lift by myself, but keep in mind, I'm not a very strong guy. So if you're a big burly macho man, you'll have no problem lifting up something a little bit bigger than that, but that should give you a judge if you're kind of similar build to me. A Couple of things to consider when standing up your walls, you wanna make sure and have cross supports ready to go with a screw in the top. So that way, once you stand the wall up, you can just run over there and zip in that screw to make sure it's gonna hold. I've also seen folks put um, blocking studs on the outside so that they can push the wall up and it'll actually hit that stud so they know when they're on the edge. I just kind of pushed mine forward and eyeballed it and had no problem doing it like that. Okay, so when you move on to a wall that does have window framing, it's really important to get this right before you start driving any nails. Um, there's four important types of pieces of wood with window framing. You have your king studs, your jack studs, your cripple studs, and your headers. You need to understand what all of those do in order to build a properly framed window. Um, I'll run you through it really quick, but there's lots of information online about this as well. Basically, the king studs are gonna be the outer studs that hold the whole thing together and transfer the load from the ceiling down to the floor. They're just gonna be what you're able to attack your jack studs into. So those are the outer ones. The next ones in are gonna be called the jack studs, and those are the important ones. They're gonna lie on the outer edges of the window where the header sits. So the header will sit on your jack studs, which will transfer the load from your header down into your floor. And what your header does is it provides an extra bit of reinforcement from the loads pushing down. So you have a span over the window that you need to reinforce since there's nothing above it. And that's what the header does. The header takes the load from the roof and divides it out over the window down into the jack studs. From there, your cripple studs are simply there as wall framing to tack things onto later, as well as something that will hold up the window sill itself, or in this case, even the window. The place that go on top and bottom of the cripple studs are called the sills, and those aren't really any big deal. They're not structural, but you will have to cover them up with trim later on. I recommend buying your doors and windows before you start building anything. You can get them used for a really great deal most of the time. I got my windows from this uh, recycled construction project store that if people over order things or there's broken pieces, they'll send them to this kind of uh, secondhand store. And I got all of the windows for this cabin, I think for like 200 bucks, which is an absolute steal because the big one is a four by four triple pane window, brand new with the stickers still on it. Um, and I got it for, like I said, 200 bucks, including the front two windows. So that's much, much cheaper than it would have been to buy it new. But the reason that you need those things bought prior to building is that you need to know how big to make the openings for your windows and doors, and that will affect all of the building and framing of the walls. So make sure you have those and you have them measured out before you start building. The last thing to remember when you're framing out doors and windows is that you have to frame out what's called the rough opening. That's not the exact width of the window, it's a little bit bigger. You'd never be able to get the window in if they were exactly the same width. So you wanna leave about a half inch on every side of the window in order for it to pop in there easily. Later on, you'll go in with some kind of foam sealer or insulation and cover up those gaps. Make sure and put some kind of sliding window in your cabin so that if it gets too hot in there, you're able to open the windows. After you've got all four of your walls stood up and braced, you can go around the bottom and nail in those bottom plates. But don't forget that the thing that's holding them in is your subfloor, which is pressure treated wood. So use nails that are galvanized or some kind of deck screw so that it doesn't rot out over time. After you have the walls nailed into your subfloor, you wanna go in and do your top plates. And the top plates should overlap each other. So the top plate from the back wall should intersect the front wall, so that way the two are tied together. And you wanna do that in all four corners. After you have that done, things should start to be feeling like a cabin, and you can go ahead and start on your wall sheathing. For your wall sheathing, you can use one of two materials. You can either use OSB or you can use uh, CDX plywood. I chose OSB because it's cheaper, and it actually is more resistant to moisture changes than uh, plywood is. A lot of people think that plywood is a better choice if things are gonna get wet, but in reality, OSB might swell more when it gets wet, but it will return more to its original shape 
than CDX does. And that's a really important thing to consider because a lot of times your project will get rained on while you're building and you don't want things to swell and buckle and have them not return to their original form once they do dry out. I can't remember if I used half inch or three eighths OSB on my walls. Um, but either one would probably be fine. You don't really need super thick OSB for the walls. Its main purpose is to lock your walls together, which will stop it from racking, which is this type of motion, and it'll really firm up the structure. Getting the OSB up onto the walls can be a little tricky if you're by yourself, but there's tricks to the trade. You can either sheet the walls while it's still on the floor and then stand it up, which I don't prefer because it's so much heavier to do that. Or what you can do is set up little um, toe boards at the bottom so a little two by four stud tacked in underneath that when you put the sheeting up, it has a lip for it to sit on. So that way it won't slide away. That way you can hold it up there, keep one hand holding pressure against it and then get your nail gun and start tacking it into the walls. Otherwise, I just recommend buying some beers and pizza and have your buddies come over and give you a hand with it. Something that I did that I recommend other folks do is have your wall sheathing extend all the way down to your subfloor. So that way it ties in the subfloor's rigidity with the walls. If the sheathing only goes right to the bottom of the walls, it's totally loose and different from the subfloor. This is just one more way of making sure that your walls are solidly connected to your subfloor. So when you're tacking in your sheathing is the time that you wanna make sure that your walls are plumb. So uh, you take your level and pull those walls nice and plumb and then tack in the sheathing and that'll lock it in place. If you don't do that, your building's gonna be all wonky once you get it tacked in. Sometimes I'll cut out the door and window openings before I put it up and other times I'll do it after I put it up. It just depends on how complex the cutouts are, but normally you can just put the sheathing up over it and then take a sawzall and go around the inside edges of the windows and then you'll have nice square cutouts. Be sure to put lots of nails in your sheathing, especially the ones that fall on a seam. And remember that your sheathing needs to line up halfway on stud seams, so you can't have the edge just sitting on nothing. It needs to be calculated out so that the sheathing falls halfway on the stud on either two pieces, so that way both of them have a nailing surface where they meet. Okay, so now you got all your walls up with the sheathing on and things will start to feel really rigid and you can actually walk inside your structure for the first time and kind of look around and get a feel for what it's gonna be like. So with all your wall framing done, it's time to move on to the roof. Roof framing is probably one of the most daunting tasks, especially for new builders. The reason being is that there's a lot of calculations that go into it that you have to get just right. And you're also working with something up in the air. So you're on a ladder and you're dealing with big, heavy posts and beams, and it can get a little sketchy, especially if you're by yourself. Before you get started on the roof, you need to decide what pitch you're gonna use. I went with a 512 pitch for this cabin, and 512 is your rise over run. So for every foot over, it goes up five inches. To give you guys some context, the roof on my main cabin here is an 812 pitch, while the one on my little cabin is a 512. I went with a 512 pitch instead of something steeper because I'd be able to walk on it without a rope at 512. It's still a little sketchy being up there, but it's not too bad at all. The 812 pitch, especially once you put the sheet metal roofing on it, you do not want to be walking on it without a rope. In fact, you pretty much can't, especially if it has any kind of water on it or snow. Depending if you're using shingles or sheet metal roofing, a 512 pitch can still shed snow. It's a lot less likely to shed snow as something like an 8 or a 12 pitch, but I've had this roof shed about twice this year, especially once it gets warmed up inside the cabin. As you can see, this one's holding a snow load right now, while the other cabin isn't, but that's, again, because that's an 812 pitch, and this one's only a five. But that 512 pitch not only made it really easy for me to get up there and do all the roof work, but I think it also has kind of a nice look to it. And again, it all depends on the area that you're in. If you're somewhere that doesn't have a ton of snow, your roof pitch is not nearly as much of a consideration as it is if you're in deep snow country. If you are building a little bit more of a substantial cabin, I would consider going with a steeper roof pitch for a couple of reasons. One, it's gonna get rid of that snow more often. The other thing is that the steeper the pitch of the roof, the more room that you're gonna have up in your loft, especially in the center. So just consider maybe something between like an 812 and even a 1212 if you're uh, looking for a lot of loft room. So there's two main ways to frame out a gable style roof like this. Uh, you can either use what's considered trusses or standard gables, which is um, two rafters with a rafter tie at the bottom. Um, and what that will end up looking like is a flat roof on the inside, because that'll be your ceiling joist. And the reason that that tie is so important is that as the load comes down on the roof from the snow or whatever it might be, it's gonna push out on the walls if there isn't a tie that holds them all together. So as the load comes down, the walls wanna spread apart. And you'll see old cabins that are like kind of shaped like this, you know? So the solution to that, if you wanna have a nice open cathedral ceiling inside your cabin, is using what's called a ridge beam. Not a ridge board, but a ridge beam. It's an important difference. 
And the difference is that the ridge beam is a structural beam that goes through the center of the roof, and then your rafters are actually gonna hang off of that. And then the ridge beam has to be supported on either side with the load transferring down into the walls. It took me a long time to get my head around it. But once you understand that the beam will actually stop the load from going out and instead transfer it down, then you can have your cathedral ceilings without having to worry about the walls bowing out. So for the ridge beam, I used a four by 10 by 16. I did a lot of research to figure out how big of a beam you would need based on your snow load and the span and the rafter size, but it is really complicated to get it just right using equations. So instead I did a little bit of research on what other folks have done for similar size cabins. And uh, so far I've been really happy with the four by 10. I haven't noticed any sagging, any problems whatsoever, even when this thing was packed full of snow this winter. The other thing to consider is that the supports for your ridge beam are gonna have a lot of load pushing down into one singular spot on your wall. So make sure and add a stud directly underneath where that ridge beam post is gonna sit. So that way you can transfer the load evenly straight down to your subfloor. So once you have your supports in, go ahead and hoist that ridge beam up there and then you're ready to move on to your roof rafters. You need to decide how tall your ceiling is going to be and at what pitch you're going to build in order to figure out the right height for your ridge posts. This part can be a little tricky, especially because you have to add in the distance of the ridge beam itself onto the calculation. I did, I think, 22 inches for my posts and then added the 10 inch ridge beam on there. So 22 plus 9 and 0.5 is 31.5 or something like that. I don't know. I probably used a calculator to figure it out. So depending on your roof pitch, the size of the buildings and how much overhang you want on the sides of your cabin will all determine a different cut for your rafters. But basically the rafter cut on the front that will sit on the ridge beam is gonna be cut at whatever angle you want your roof pitch to be. Use your speed square to figure this out. So for 512, there's a marking on your speed square that says five and you'll just hold it against the edge, run a line and cut it. And that's gonna be making sure that the uh, rafter is flush with the ridge beam. Then to figure out your bird's mouth, you actually wanna take the distance of the span between the ridge beam itself and where it will sit on the wall. And then you're gonna figure out what a triangle would look like, a right triangle with that distance going up and out. Once you have the first rafter cut and fitting good, use it as a template to trace all your other rafters before you put it up. Do a lot of research. There's other things called like the step down method. Some people literally just eyeball it. There's a lot of different ways to go, but basically you're gonna want your bird's mouth notches to sit nice and tight up against your top plate. And then the cut that sits against your ridge beam to also sit nice and flush. When you're cutting out your roof rafters, consider how much overhang you're gonna have. I wanted to have a lot of overhang with my cabin to make sure that it kept the snow and the rain away from the foundation. It also helps keep all the water off of the walls. But what you don't wanna do is end up with a weird amount of overhang that'll make it so your plywood that goes on the decking of your roof or your sheet metal roofing has to be cut and little scraps have to be left over. So if you plan accordingly, you can make your rafters total run the same distance of dimensional lumber, like four foot or eight foot. And so for this cabin, I planned my rafter run to be just under eight feet. That way I could buy eight foot rafters, fit eight foot sheets of plywood, and use eight foot sheet metal roofing up there and still have enough room for a ridge vent and fascia board later on. Once you got all your rafters cut out, it's time to tack them in. And what I did was I set the rafters up and toenailed them two nails on either side of where the bird's mouth joint sat on the top plate. And then I did two nails on either side as well where it went into the ridge beam. The reason I didn't use more nails into the ridge beam is that I went in and used joist hangers on top of that, which is gonna hold all the load instead of the nail. A lot of people said that this was overkill, but I don't know. I felt a whole lot better knowing that the vast majority of the snow load was gonna be bearing down on these rafters. So it'd just be nice to have an actual joist hanger, making sure that that was gonna sit tight. The only other thing I'll say about doing the roof is don't get frustrated. It can take a long time to get in the groove with those rafters. I wasted quite a few boards trying to get my cutouts just right, only to find out that my ridge beam was slightly twisted. And so even though I had the math right, it wasn't fitting exact. So I tried to accommodate for that, which turns out then the other ones didn't fit because it was the ridge beam that was slightly bowed the whole time. Also, remember that framing doesn't need to be perfect. You actually have a lot of forgiveness when it comes to rough framing. You'll be able to cover it up with finish work, maybe, most of the time. So a special consideration for my roof was that I wanted to have a four foot overhang for the porch. Um, and so when I framed out my walls, I made sure to have the top plates extend out past the main walls by four feet. That way I'd have something to support my rafters to. And then those overhangs are supported by the porch posts, which I cut down some spruce trees to make those. Gives it a nice kind of rustic look. And uh, 
I put those in before I finished putting the rest of my rafters up. So you wanna make sure to have those supported before you put any weight on them. By the way, don't forget to put blocking in between all of your roof rafters and on the top of that blocking, make sure to put some kind of stucco netting or something that's gonna keep the critters from getting up into your roof eaves. So once you got all your rafters in place, it's time to start doing the roof sheathing. I decided to use CDX for my roof instead of OSB because it's lighter weight and easier to get up there. And it also holds the roofing screws better in my opinion. The OSB can kind of just shred when you put your sheet metal screws in and the uh, plywood seems to actually have a little bit more bite in it. So I really like using plywood uh, for the roof decking. I've seen a lot of different methods for getting your sheathing up there, but what I did was um, slide it up the ladder and then I had a tow board on the edge of the rafters, temporary, just nailed in so that way when I put the sheet up there, it couldn't slide off the roof. It would just slide down and sit on that tow board. Then once I got it tacked in, I removed those tow boards and then I was able to just keep stacking the new pieces of plywood on the lip of the previous one. A detail I forgot to mention before was that I used two by eights for my roof rafters. Um, two by sixes probably would have been fine for the span that I have, but I wanted to make sure that this roof was gonna hold up to a big snow load if it wasn't gonna shed the snow. Since it's a 512 pitch, like I said, it probably won't shed the snow in most circumstances, so a really hefty roof was going to be important so that it could just hold that snow load rather than rely on it being shed. The other thing that's nice about a 2x8 is that it allows more room for insulation in your ceiling, and that is a really big deal. A lot of the heat goes up, and so you want to make sure to have as much insulation in your ceiling as possible. So once your roof sheathing is up and everything's all tacked in, you want to use some kind of underlayment before your main roofing material goes on top. This will help keep the water out in case there is some kind of leak with your roofing. You can use a product called Grace Ice and Water Shield, which is a really heavy duty waterproof membrane that will stick to the roof. And that stuff is really bomb proof. If you're worried about getting any kind of ice damming um, or leaks in your roof, I recommend using that Grace Ice and Water Shield, especially on the first few feet of the edges, because that's where the ice damming is most likely to occur. And that's basically when ice forms on the edges and the new water that melts up top from the heat of the cabin comes down, it has nowhere to go, and it'll back up into the roof and come down your walls. And uh, that Grace Ice and Water Shield can actually completely waterproof um, the top of your roof. I didn't really anticipate having a problem with ice damming on this cabin. One, because it's not heated all the time, and the other thing is that I got a lot of insulation in the roof with a good air barrier between where the insulation sits and the top of the decking, which keeps uh, the roof cold. And so not much water really melts off this roof at all. But I definitely put down layers of tar paper. And you wanna start from the bottom row and work your way up. That way each layer of tar paper can lap over the one previous. Once you get to the ridge of the roof, make sure that you don't put tar paper over that. You need what's called a ridge vent in this style of cabin, and that's where all the moisture is gonna go up to the peak of the cabin and then be able to escape, and that'll keep the moisture from building up and condensating up in the top of your roof. Once you have your tar paper or your ice and water shield down, it's time to put on the sheet metal top. And this is really important because once this is done, then you can really take a breath and not worry about the elements getting in and ruining your framing. I always use corrugated metal roofing on all my structures. I don't really like to use shingles because I want the snow to shed off. But keep in mind that if you're using sheet metal, the snow is likely gonna shed. So you don't wanna put your doors or any kind of access point below where that roof might shed. One, it'll block off the access to your cabin and it's also really dangerous if it's an area that people might travel because you could be walking to the outhouse or something like that and the roof could shed and come down and kill you, which happens in Alaska more often than you might think. If the first panel isn't totally square, it's just gonna exponentially get more and more off kilter as you head down the side of the roof. So make sure that that first one is nice and flush with both the eave and the ridge of your cabin. And just like your roof underlayment, make sure that your sheet metal doesn't go all the way up and connect. You need to have that air space in the middle for the moisture to escape. That gap ends up being covered by your ridge cap. But before you put on your ridge cap, make sure that you put on the drip edge on your eaves, which is the piece of sheet metal going down along the sides here, before you put on the ridge cap, because that needs to go underneath it. I made the mistake of putting on my ridge cap first because I couldn't find the eave trim that I needed. And then once I got it, I had to go in and undo the ridge cap, slide it underneath, and then retack it down, which wasn't too big of a deal, but it's definitely easier if you put that on first. The last step of your roof is going to be putting on what's called the fascia board, which is the uh, piece of wood that goes around the edges of all of your rafters and eaves. And I used live edge spruce siding for mine, so that way it has a cool rustic bark edge look to it. And uh, if you guys have some, some live edge and you want that cabin look, I think it looks really awesome. And it's so much cheaper than buying actual uh, lumber for that, so. 
All right, so now that you've got your roof on, it's all weatherproof, it's time to start on the Tyvek. Putting up your Tyvek is not a step that you're gonna wanna skip. It adds a big wind coat to your cabin, basically keeping all the air from getting in through your seams. And it also keeps the water off of your walls. So it's a really handy material that's breathable, but also waterproof, a lot like Gore-Tex. Once you get to this phase of the cabin build, a staple hammer is gonna be your best friend. And knowing how to unjam them is also equally important. So get yourself one of those and watch a video on how to get a staple hammer unjammed because it will jam on you. So just start on one edge and start wrapping the Tyvek around, whacking it in with some staples as you go. Then once you're done, you can go in with your utility blade and cut out the openings for the doors and windows. If you guys notice on this cabin, I did not fold the Tyvek in over the window sills. I did that intentionally because I wasn't worried at all about water getting to my windows because I have such big overhangs and this is not a very windy area. If you're in a windy area or somewhere with a lot of rain or you don't have much overhang, Folding that Tyvek into your sills is gonna be really important. Otherwise, the water coming down the walls will get behind the Tyvek and will slowly rot out your building. After getting the Tyvek done, I started putting in my doors and windows. One of the big mistakes I made with this cabin was not framing the door opening correctly, and so I ended up having to shave off some of the header in order to make the door fit. A lot of people ask me why I didn't cut off the bottom of the door, but the door is contained inside of a jam, and the framing of the jam is all stapled together and it is pre-hung with the door, and you can't just cut that jam off without having to put it back together, which would be a big nightmare. So I just cut the header out a little bit and called it a day. Depending if you're using vinyl windows or wood frame windows, the installation process is pretty different. Vinyl windows are a lot easier. You just uh, put it into the rough opening and use screws through the flanges on the side to support it. Um, a lot of people use shims underneath and on the sides of the window to square it up and get it nice and true before they tack it in. Um, one important step that I have never done before but did on this cabin was adding a bead of silicone around the inside edges of all the windows and that really stops the air from getting in and gives you a nice tight seal. Windows can get tricky if you're putting them in by yourself. I had to get really creative to put in this massive window. Again, this is a four foot by four foot triple pane window and it is a heavy sucker. And not only is it heavy, it's really awkward to hold. You have to have your wings way spread out like an eagle. And trying to lift that up five or six feet into the air to put into the cabin was nearly impossible by myself. So I ended up using my truck bed and a little bit of hillbilly ingenuity to get that window popped in there. But if you're using big windows, plan on having someone come and help you put them in. So there's some considerations when it comes to the order that you do things. I didn't want to put up my siding yet because the nails for the siding will often stick through the interior wall and I didn't want to have to be dealing with that when I was putting in my insulation and my wiring. So for me the best order of operations was doing my Tyvek, doors and windows, then did my wiring, then insulation, and then finally I did my exterior siding. Wiring up a little cabin like this can be pretty simple if you're just doing a few plugs, and I wanted mine to be tied into the main breaker of my big cabin so that way I could have a single electricity source powering both. And remember that this is a totally off-grid setup, so I have a power station that runs my main cabin, and then my little cabin is piggybacked off of that. When the battery runs out on that power station, I use a 2000 watt Yamaha generator to charge it back up. I also have a small solar panel for it, but most of the time I end up using gas because it's such a small solar panel, I don't really have enough to recharge it. I just have enough to sort of add a little bit here and there. So while the wiring for a project like this is fairly simple, if you know what you're doing, I really don't know what I'm doing with electricity and I wanted someone to come up and help me. So I took the opportunity to fly my friend Mason up from Washington to help me wire the cabin, who uh, is an electrician and is really proficient with this type of thing. So he knew exactly how to put everything together so that it would make the most sense and be safe. Remember that most of the studs in your cabin walls are probably load bearing. And if you put a hole that's either too big or too close to the edges, it's likely that it will um, compromise its structural strength. So make sure to put your holes for the wiring directly in the center of the studs and don't make them any bigger than they need to be in order to get the um, Romex ran through them. One of the main regrets that I have on my main cabin here is that I didn't add very many outlets when I first put it together. I thought, oh, having an outlet on each wall will be plenty. And over the years, I've found that having more outlets would have been really nice. I end up having to run extension cords and uh, power strips in order to get everything that I want plugged in. So I'd recommend adding a few more than you think you need rather than less. When you're picking out your electrical boxes, consider what kind of siding you're gonna use for the interior of the cabin. If you're gonna use drywall versus tongue and groove or some kind of paneling, all of those different sidings have different thicknesses. And that thickness is really important to get right so that the electrical boxes sit flush with your interior walls. 
If they're not, there are some adjustable brackets that you can get to flush them out, but it's much easier to get the right boxes for the siding that you're gonna use. To tie the small cabin into the main cabin, I used a 70 foot run of Romax wire, and I used the gray kind, which is actually rated for underground burial. A lot of folks said that I should have put that Romax through some kind of conduit like PVC, and that would have been better probably to protect it from things disturbing the soil, like if for some reason someone tried to dig there. But I knew I wasn't gonna do any digging in the driveway, so I just went ahead and buried the Romex, which again, that stuff is rated for ground burial. Um, so it's not gonna degrade underneath the ground. The only thing that could happen is something like a shovel or a big backhoe coming in and breaking that line. We ran wire to all the outlets and electrical boxes and then up into the rafters for the can lights that I was gonna install later on. I also sent two runs of wire to the front of the cabin, one for like an overhead light that's motion censored for out in front of the cabin and then another for the porch light that goes right in front of the door. Once you're done wiring, it's time to start insulating your cabin. And this is a pretty messy job. Fiberglass insulation is really irritating on the skin. And so you wanna use something like a rain jacket, face mask, goggles, put your hood up, really try to protect yourself from the little particles that break off from the fiberglass. It'll work its way into your skin and can be really itchy and irritating, especially in your eyes and in your lungs. There are other types of insulation out there. You could do spray foam insulation, you could do um, foam board insulation, or you could even use something like rock wool. But for me, fiberglass is the most readily available, cheap and effective way to insulate a cabin. The size of your studs will determine how much insulation you can get into your walls. Like I said, I use two by four walls, so I think I was only able to get like R15 insulation into the walls. And the R value of insulation is just how warm it is. So the higher the R value, the more insulating properties it has. Um, you can get an R15 for two by four walls all the way up to like an R38. That would go like in your ceiling if you have a full foot of room up there. Obviously for a cabin like this, we don't have any space for something like that. But here on my main cabin, I have big trusses that have a full foot and a half of space between the ceiling and the roof. So I was able to put R38 in there. And it really makes a big difference to have a lot of insulation in your roof. Since I was using two by eights for the roof framing on this little cabin, I was able to get R21 up in there. I could have used a slightly bigger insulation that's actually designed for two by eights, but you have to install baffles if you do that. And baffles are gonna be uh, these like styrofoam or cardboard um, sheets that stop the insulation from pressing up and against the top of your roof. And that does two things. It keeps a, a line of airflow from your eaves up to that ridge vent that we talked about. And it also stops it from transferring heat into your roof, creating what's called a hot roof. What you want in a cold climate is a cold roof. That way you don't get ice damming and melt off the top of your roof. Insulation comes in different dimensions that are designed to go into different size walls. So whether it's 24 inch center studs or 16 inch on center, it'll have different widths pre-cut and will fit perfectly between them so that way you don't have to do any messing around with it. It also comes in different lengths, many of which are designed for eight foot walls. So shop around and figure out exactly the right insulation that's gonna make your project the easiest. After you've got all the insulation in, it's time to move on to the vapor barrier. And these are necessary in certain climates and not necessary in other climates. But what's important to understand is that warm air holds moisture. And as that warm air cools, it will then condensate and the moisture that's in the air will then turn to water. And so as the warm air moves through your walls, through the insulation and hits that outer wall, which is cold, it's then gonna turn to water. And you can get uh, moisture on the insides of your walls behind the insulation, which will cause your walls to rot. So if you're in a climate that has cold on the outside and warm on the inside, you're definitely gonna to wanna to use um, some kind of vapor barrier. It also cuts down on draft coming from the outside of the cabin in. And if they're in a place that has flies or bugs, this will be the key element for keeping them out. I did not use a vapor barrier in the ceiling of my main cabin here, which was a huge regret. I used craft-faced um, insulation, which is supposed to have a built-in vapor barrier, and it probably works okay for vapor, but it leaves enough edges between everything that little flies and bugs can crawl down through that insulation and make their way into the cabin. So in the fall, as it starts getting cold outside, I'll come into my cabin and I'll have tons of black flies that have made their way from the cold air and into a safe, warm place. I think if I'd used a real vapor barrier around the entire ceiling, I probably would have a lot less problems with that. If you're building a cabin that you're gonna spend a lot of time in with a lot of interior moisture, 
definitely go through and tape all of the seams where the vapor barrier overlaps and also tape around your outlets and anywhere that would allow moisture in behind your walls. The next step for me was getting my floor done. I wanted to be able to get the floor in tight to the edges without having to worry about the interior siding, so I did that first. When you're installing any kind of flooring, you want to put some kind of underlayment. The underlayment will add a little bit of squish to the floor so it's not super hard, but it also helps insulate and yet another air and vapor barrier that can help keep moisture and heat in your cabin. Once you have your underlayment down, you can pick out whatever kind of flooring you want. You can use carpet or hardwood or whatever you want, but I decided to use click together uh, fake hardwood flooring for mine. It's a laminate. Uh, the stuff that I found is waterproof, which is really nice um, for a cabin like this since there's no Arctic entryway. A lot of uh, tracking in with mud and snow and water, things like that will happen. So I'm not worried about it since I have a waterproof floor and I think it will hold up good over the years. Push the pieces together and get them to click firm before you start tapping it in with the hammer. I found that it works a lot better. If you are using click together flooring like this, you want to avoid having the seams all line up. They need to be staggered. So what I did was I just put um, two full pieces down and then measured out the remainder until I got to the wall, cut a piece for that, and then I start my next row with whatever cut out piece I had from the last piece of the previous row. That way you end up with seams on different places throughout and you also don't end up with a bunch of waste. For my interior siding, I use Knotty Pine Tongue and Groove, which to me just has the most cabin-esque look. You actually feel like you're in a log cabin even though it's stick frame. And it goes in pretty easily and it also firms up your walls really nicely. You can always just put up drywall and paint if that's your thing, but for a cabin-esque look, definitely go with some kind of wood tongue and groove. Tongue and groove boards come in a variety of different sizes and I went with uh, one inch by eight inch boards. That way you get a lot more coverage per board. If you use four inch boards, you're gonna be making double the amount of cuts and having to install double the amount of boards. So depending on the look that you're going for, you can kind of pick whatever suits your needs best. My suggestion is to not try and force anything. You'll end up breaking the tongue or the groove on the pieces, which makes them not interlock properly. I always buy extra tongue and groove when I'm doing a project because you end up needing a lot more than you might think, especially with the waste. You have to have the edges fall on a seam and sometimes you end up having to make more cuts than you might think, so definitely buy some extra boards. If you're planning on painting the tongue and groove or staining it, I recommend doing it before you put it up. It's a lot easier to make it look clean and right if you do it before you install it on the walls. I didn't use any kind of stain or treatment on any of the tongue and groove I've done. Over the years, pine will start to yellow in the sunshine, so the longer this cabin sits, the darker and more honey-colored the wood will start to look as well. A mistake I made on my first cabin, which I made sure not to make on this cabin, was uh, cutting my tongue and groove too far away from my edges. I thought, oh, I'll just go in with trim afterwards and make it look nice, but it's much better result if you just try to cut that tongue and groove right up to the exact edge that you want it to be on. Then when you go to put your trim on, it's for sure gonna cover it up and you're not gonna have an awkward gap for it. As you guys can see, and as many of you noted, I did not do the trim for my door yet. The reason for that is that there's a distance between the door jam and the wood that's not gonna be flush. So I'm gonna need to go in with a small strip here before I can add some trim on so that it will sit flush. But I am going to do it. I just ran out of steam before I finished the video. And uh, thanks guys for all noting that yes, I didn't do my door trim, but don't worry, I'm gonna do it. Speaking of trim, that brings us to our next step, which is gonna be trimming out your windows. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is add your sills, which will be the plates that go around the inside of the framing. And then once the sills are in, you can do whatever kind of trim you like. I used my leftover spruce siding and I ripped one edge of it so that I had a nice clean cut for the inside edge of the windows and then left the live edge bark on the other side. And I think it really came out nice. It's a little tricky to get the bark to line up at the corners since it's not dimensional. You can do a little bit of figuring actually when you cut the two pieces and kind of get the corners of the bark to line up just right if you get lucky. Like this one I'll show you. That edge there came out pretty good. Others did not come out so good. So if you do something like that, make sure that the width of your corners lines up so that way your bark might have a chance of meeting. Really put a lot of thought into your exterior siding because this is gonna be exactly how the cabin looks. A lot of folks will just put up T111 and paint it, which to me just looks like a shed, but using some kind of rough cut spruce siding like this gives it a nice rustic cabin feel, even though it's stick framed. Check around with your local sawmills and see if you can find some kind of rough cut siding. A lot of times it's a byproduct of them cutting dimensional lumbers and you can buy a big old rack of this stuff for not much money at all. It comes in really good handy for other projects. You can build stairs, 
and shelves and a plethora of other things with those boards for a really good price. I did what's called a board and batten style siding, which is vertical siding where you lay two boards flat and then do what's called a batten board that covers up the gap between them. And you just want to measure and make sure that the gap between the two boards isn't so wide that your covering piece um, doesn't reach the edges, especially with enough um, room on either side to put a nail in. What I would do is lay one board down, figure out the gap, and then lay my next board down, and then nail a covering board over the top of both of those, and then just go all the way around the cabin. And again, make sure that these boards butt all the way up against your windows. Take the time and get those cuts right. You don't want to try to be using trim on those since they're not all on the same um, plane. They're not flush with each other. And so if you try to put some kind of trim on them, you're going to get these weird gaps in it. There is a consideration with this type of siding that there is gaps underneath the front boards that things like bats or mice or squirrels could get up in there. I've never had a problem with anything like that with my cabin and it's been here for nine years. Never had anything get in there and cause damage except for a hornet's nest. I actually did get up in there underneath my porch and I had to spray them out with hornet killer. But um, you could add some sort of block to the top and bottom of them, maybe like a foam sealer or something like that if you're worried about it, but I never did. In case you want to do bunks, I really recommend building them with some kind of log edge like that. You want to have some kind of support against the wall and tie the back end of these bunks right into the wall. That way the shifting around up top doesn't affect the person down below and it also saves you space. So that way you're not having to um, push the bunk bed up against the wall with a back um, support post. It just is the wall and uh, you get a bit more space for that. These bunks are 30 inches wide by 78 inches long. And the 30 inches is just enough for a full grown guy to be pretty comfortable, depending on how much room you like. But uh, a standard twin bed is 38 inches, which is way too wide for this tiny cabin. Um, I bought these foam mattresses from a box store, I think at like Fred Meyer. Um, I went into town and got four of them for like 20 bucks a piece and I doubled them up and they're pretty dang comfortable actually. So anyway, if you guys decide to do bunk beds, take my advice and anchor them into the wall. All right guys, let's talk about heaters. Obviously a cabin should have a wood stove in it. It just should. But for this tiny little cabin, having a propane heater was gonna be a way better choice. If I use a wood stove, I'd also have to have a big area around it so that nothing caught on fire and it would just eat up too much space in this cabin. The other thing is that you have to cut wood for all that and then you have to rely on your guests to properly stoke the wood stove and not burn the place down. So between all those things, I decided to go with a little propane heater. This is an Empire heater. It's a 10,000 BTU um, propane heater that is vented to the outside. And I'll show you guys on the outside what that vent looks like. But if you use a non-vented propane heater inside of a small structure like this, it's gonna put off a lot of moisture. It is totally safe to run a propane heater inside of a closed space, but it does put off so much water that you're actually gonna have problems with moisture buildup inside of the structure. It also doesn't smell great. But this heater is awesome for a couple of reasons. One, it barely sips propane, and it also doesn't need electricity to run. So again, this is an off-grid cabin, and so if the power runs out in the middle of the night or I decide to shut off the generator, the folks in here will be able to keep the heat on even without the power running. So when you want this thing to get going, just pop the front off, and there's a pilot switch right here that you'll just turn on the propane, and it has an igniter, and you press the button, and it'll fire up and get going. One thing that I haven't done yet was tack up my thermostat wire. I need to put some staples in and clean it up and make it look good. But uh, this runs up to a little thermostat that I can set the heat for pretty much whatever temperature I want. What I like about that thermostat is that you can set it really low so that it's like 40 degrees in here. Just barely enough to keep anything from freezing and maintained, but definitely not wasting much fuel. So this is the exterior vent for where your propane heater is. And the only advice I've been given about these is to put them on the side that you think is gonna be least windy. Um, a good wind can go in and actually blow out your pilot light if it's really blowing hard. And then I've got uh, a couple of propane bottles here. I have one that's hooked up and I always have a small extra that's full. Just in case this one runs out, I can swap over to the other one and keep the heat going. All right guys, and as promised, I'm gonna tell you exactly how much I spent in materials to build this cabin, and that number was $6,688. Now keep in mind that price is gonna fluctuate a lot depending on the lumber market, the area that you're in, and just exactly the size and scope of your building project. I was also able to save a lot of money by getting used windows, used doors, some used lumber here and there, so this is gonna be a really rough estimate on what this cabin would cost. 
I also wanted to remind you guys to check out my website at www.alaskacabinadventures.com. I've got my music for sale there. I have merchandise for sale. I have more information about my cabins and the build process. I also have lots of photos and other things like that. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and found something useful from it. Everything I'm telling you now are just things that I figured out as I went. You don't need to have all this knowledge before you start building. Just get out there and start swinging a hammer. Maybe build a chicken coop or an outhouse or something like that. And uh, once you start to understand the basics of putting wood together, you all of a sudden realize that something like this cabin is totally within your reach, even if you're an amateur builder. So hopefully you guys can learn from the mistakes that I made and get started on your next project with some confidence. And don't forget that if you guys want to see more on the building of this cabin, I documented the whole build process. I have a six part series as well as all of those series compiled into one start to finish build video. You can find those in the video section of my channel. I'll see you guys on the next episode of Alaska Cabin Adventures.